let me start from the short uh, introduction to a couple of videos. We will discuss in the end of the presentation. Armen, can you just talk a bit? Yeah. Okay, there was a couple of three minutes of uh, videos in Russian. I, I thought there are subtitles, but actually they are not. Sorry. Uh, but for Russian speakers, it's really uh, it's really important to to watch. So the first video is a uh, uh, feminist activist. Uh, with a sociological background. Her name is Nika. And uh, she she talks that there is no such thing as reverse sexism. She said something like, uh, some feminists think that there is, there is such thing as a reverse yeah. sexism because they didn't study sociology. Yeah. Uh, you could huh? try the automatic subtitles. Yeah. But, well, I have to switch into uh, English it, it speaking. Yeah. Because no, it's, 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 it's such as... Uh, but there are... Uh, Русский будет написан. Надо иметь на английский, чтобы был английский. Окей, и second video is uh, uh, flat earth supporter video. I know all the Как вы считаете, земля имеет форму шара или она плоская? Она имеет форму эллипса. Хорошо. А вы можете А вы можете это доказать? А вы можете это доказать? Я в космосе не бывал. Нет, зато не А если я вам докажу, что она плоская, вы решите, что я сумасшедший? Нет. Как вы считаете, земля имеет форму шара, а она плоская? Плоская. Спасибо. Окей. Это было начало. Удобный, друзья, ролик, наверное, будет длинный. Потому что то, что я хочу сказать, не так уж и просто сказать. Ведь есть такая вещь, как мнение. Мнение формируется из человека. И в зависимости от того, кто ты, тот, кто смотрит этот ролик, такое же будет мнение. Поэтому я одновременно могу обратиться вроде бы как бы ко всем сразу, а с другой стороны разговариваю к каждому. Well, uh, I, I'm sorry that I in the, in the video of Nika, he later told like I talk only to feminist supporters. Like no, if you don't support feminist idea, just switch all the video. And here this guy, just to all the people. Yeah, no. Как я начинаю говорить с тобой? В этом есть некоторая сложность, потому что каждый раз зритель разный. То есть ты как зритель каждый раз новый человек. 
Тема плоской земли. Я этот ролик снимаю не для популярности, не для положительной, не для отрицательной. У меня на канале отключена реклама, у меня скрыты комментарии, и какая-либо монетизация за чем роликов ко мне не идет. То есть я это делаю по большому счету для того, чтобы, как обычно, как я думаю, внести некую ясность в те или иные процессы, которые происходят у нас на планете, исходя из моего понимания. Пару месяцев назад в интернете появилась информация о том, что ребята, а Земля оказывается не шат. Вот да, что хочешь с этим делать? В том году нам пичкали информацию о том, что она оказывается у нас полая, то есть внутри что-то есть, есть даже входы и тому подобное. Есть, а в этом году вот такое вот новое видео, модное, она оказывается у нас вот. Естественно, как человек, который давным-давно варится в тени я не стал критически оценивать эту информацию, типа, земля плоская, ты идиот, иди отсюда, да, она Я заинтересовался, и честно скажу, вот лично я очень долгое время не мог воспринимать эту информацию серьезно. То есть мне скидывают, мне скидывают статьи, я смотрю на ребят, думаю, ну нормально, зачем вы мне это скидываете? Но, как обычно это бывает, натиск людей, которые мне это скидывали, в общем-то, был серьезным. И я начал свое знакомство с этой информацией. Сразу скажу, в российском сегменте интернета эта информация начала лариноразно появляться. Okay, I think uh, everyone feels the atmosphere uh, in both videos. So let's start with the presentation. Uh, uh, I just want to start with the reflection of what the platforms in these days. So popularity of YouTube and other platforms show that the, there is a change of uh, public life. The boundaries of private and public have shifted and become blurred. And uh, several types of these private public actions have become a more crucial part of the everyday life of a lot of people. So, uh, my colleagues before explained uh, very well this. This shift was considered in internet studies through the several uh, concepts developed more than 10 years ago, so, for example, network publics or participatory culture. And along with the criticism to, of uh, observability and organization, It was described as the birth of a new social dimension where people realize what they lack in offline life. For example, network publics were developed, were developed uh, based on the interviews with the teenagers who couldn't go for a walk in the late evening and they, uh, they were chat, chat, chatting uh, uh, and had uh, their own life in online. And moreover, there are some researches uh, show that even the production of knowledge was viewed as a where it was viewed as a literal network process that was coordinated in the net online communities. However, optimism about the possible horizontal structure of this type of social relations was destroyed uh, by the growing growing of commodification of everyday life in the internet. Uh, we all know this again my colleagues before uh, I'm not sure. The accumulation of social and symbolic capitals in terms of review and the emergence of internet leverages, micro influencers, and so on. So it led to, to inequality and the key category describing the status of a blogger and the, his or her relationship with the audience became uh, the category of influencer, which Chris <coughs> and I do very well. Uh, so influencers and uh, micro influencers are normally described as uh, agents of influencing on consumer. Practices shaping lifestyles, news uh, breakers, and, and so on. And there is no question on the impact on people's perceptions and the manners around. I mean, there is no uh, research in platform studies showing how this process uh, goes. And I, firstly, I, I <coughs> use the uh, everyday uh, everyday term. An expert, because even the, the level of the language, a person who has a certain position and publicly declares it, most likely will be called an expert 
if you speak uh, publicly mm, in, in, in several in, in several times, some someone will call you an expert. Uh, and this whole definition, yeah, it's related to the way expertise is defined in social science. I just took a couple of uh, definitions. Uh, expertise is a network connecting together actors, instruments, statements, and institutional arrangements, and the complex mediation of knowledge between different social groups. Yeah, but most of the research focuses on expertise uh, are about complex cases of authorities, organization, and experts as people who are uh, somehow involved in the Institute of Science and provide their social interests in cooperation with a large number of agents. I call it uh, the weak program, uh, which is strictly linked to the figure or the situation of decision making. I mean, uh, usually we uh, use the term of expertise uh, I mean, in institutional uh, frame uh, as a process of decision making and a decision maker uh, asks for expertise. However, there is a study of experience and expertise, uh, so-called third wave of uh, science and technology studies, uh, which offers a broader program of distinguishing between three types of expertise. Contributory, which is science itself, uh, Interactional, uh, which uh, which is about uh, communicating and trans transmission, uh, and ubiquitous, which is like basic knowledge uh, or something like this. Uh, the key difference uh, is the transfer of expertise to the level of linguistic assignment and the knowledge translation practices. I call it a strong program uh, because it includes a much wider range of situations, uh, and it really. It's quite sufficient to describe the interaction and expertise of bloggers. We could uh, construct a frame uh, to show how they uh, translate, for example, Nika, Nick's feminist, translates uh, the feminist knowledge in her blogs. Uh, but always it implies a process of translation from scientific knowledge, or uh, something can be called scientific. So, uh, in the Strong program, there is a hierarchy of knowledge uh, which is significantly reduces Collins and Evans, uh, the founder of this program, heuristic ability to situations of everyday social, everyday social exchange. Well, uh, and in fact, uh, there are no uh, applied studies of this basic knowledge, the uh, ubiquitous expertise. Uh, and uh, I would say this element looks like a decoration or a patch covering uh, of the excessive and, and the unrealizable and realistic claims of the strong program. No, no studies, no universalistic claims. Well, uh, in this sense, uh, we could uh, construct the uh, way to study ubiquitous expertise or <coughs> to look at the situation of expertise from the other side. Uh, I mean, to go to the basic level now, uh, in its more general form, uh, expertise is associated, associated with the ability to make a distinction in the reality. Uh, I mean, just to make a judgment about the, uh, what is more important, to make judgment about this distinction. Mm, as we know from uh, uh, expertise studies, more often than not, uh, 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 it has a um, I think I was I I want to sleep when I when I when I woke. Okay. Uh, the main thing is that uh, there is a more basic uh, form of expertise of making distinction, and uh, it's a kind of relation, social relationship. And uh, when you make an uh, expertise judgment, it's and uh, you have a feedback. It's the way of, to be to criticize and to be criticized. Uh, so in a broad sense, expertise is a private, uh, is a private, is a, is a, is a more basic and more institutionalized way, uh, case of criticism. Luke Baldansky writes uh, about critical moments uh, where criticism arises. The person who realizes that something does not work rarely remains silent. I mean, if you, if you see, uh, if you see that something is wrong, you, uh, you make a judgment, you make a distinction, the, uh, your own uh, 
uh, you draw your own uh, picture of reality. So, Lubavansky draws a picture uh, in a number of his works where critical activity is one of the most important forms of social ties that constitutes uh, the criminality of our social perception. Uh, yes, of course, it's possible to ask if this thesis is universal, but all of, uh, of all the global platforms, YouTube, uh, most uh, associated, associated with the process of opening and the description and reopening uh, of the world. I mean, uh, a lot of genres, most genres of YouTube, is about uh, description. It's review, reaction, inst instructions, experiments, and from all of the things like how to make beer at home, uh, what will be if you put rose in a coke or something like this. Uh, and at first glance, if we uh, think about it, YouTube has the features of a platform that has an anticipated criticism. Uh, an anticipated criticism. All four forms of knowledge open their conduits and use numerous technical capabilities and resources in order to convince the audience that they are right. Uh, and like uh, everyday life, where critical moments do not happen so often, the quick cultural logic of YouTube, what was more than 10 years ago, as I said, uh, particular culture now becomes uh, so called uh, culture of critics. So let's go back uh, to the cases. Uh, how to show uh, the mechanics of criticism and the possible elements of uh, the spatial critics. The first case uh, is Nixon. Nixon uh, mm. Both bloggers legitimize their story, critics to other traditional views, by the necessity of discovering what is unknown and incomprehensible to the majority. And establishing the right uh, to establish the right social order. <coughs> in terms of Baldansky, this is an appeal to the values of the civic world. I won't uh, stop uh, much of, of, of this theory, but we can talk about that later. Uh, Nixon, the way of victimizing critics, is more connected with the traditional institute of knowledge production. Several times she appeals uh, to her sociological background and explains that it's a proper way to explain how things go. In the beginning of the video, she suggested not to watch or at least not to command those who do not agree with her explanatory scheme of uh, sexism or reversity. So, if, uh, even if uh, feminism as an institutional form of knowledge requests really a hierarchical way to be publicly represented. Consequently, Mr. Dixon, uh, Roman Milovanov is much more open, doubting, and more uh, about raising questions than giving answers. So actually he doesn't state that the earth is flat, but he speaks about the importance of non-institutionalized inquiry to the wide range of spheres. In spite of, the, of, this, in spite of this, YouTube started to ban videos that are suspected of supporting flat earth views, and as a result, Roman Milovan changed titles into flat food. Uh, so now it still works. Uh, uh, so non-institutional forms of knowledge folk theories, which are not theories of strict sense, are friendly to the audience and more com comfortable to, to comprehend. What we have learned from this theory is really a short glance of two, um, two cases. That talking theoretically on knowledge influencing and social media we should go on a more basic level from expertise to critics. Uh, second one. YouTube became a platform uh, of and for critical moments. Uh, transforming the cultural logic of the participatory culture into the culture of critics. Non-institutional and institutional forms of knowledge com compete for the audience uh, in as impartial and symmetrical way as possible. I mean, uh, I refer to the um, principles of a uh, strong program of sociology of scientific knowledge, and uh, YouTube is the best example uh, of uh, uh, where knowledge uh, competes in a more symmetrical way. No, no, no. Only pragmatism uh, of, of, into the, of the knowledge, and however, it doesn't form the anticipation of critics, which is uh, which is to be supposed. Uh, thank you. Okay. Now uh, let's proceed with uh, questions from so your eyes. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks very much. I would have a question for Olga. Um, so I guess the question is about the, um, the conceptual value of the notion of self-censorship. Um, from the last slide that you showed, it seemed to me that what people understand as self-censorship, uh, in part, um, is more or less the liberal notion of freedom. So it's about not kind of intruding into other people's spaces and kind of, you know, these kinds of things, which is a very classical definition of freedom, not of self-censorship. And, uh, but this is what your participant said, I understood. Mm -hmm. And my question would be, how do you actually conceptually, uh, well, treat the, the category of self-censorship, which is, after all, um, in the first place, a political category, not, an, not, not a kind of social scientific category? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think that there is some uh, mixture of attitudes concerning uh, where is the uh, <coughs> limits of uh, uh, one's freedom and where is the uh, political uh, pressure uh, of uh, his or her action. Uh, I suppose that re they realized and I've got uh, some fragment uh, about uh, political censorship, uh, they realized that like, uh, Russian social media is not uh, free, uh, but some of uh, uh, students uh, who are behaving themselves inside of social media try to switch uh, from political issues to other issues, discuss more some identity issues, mm -hmm. and try to do not think about it, but they uh, realize realize that it's some uncomfortable place for them and try to move to another places mm -hmm. of uh, their impressions, mm -hmm. identity impressions. I think it looks like uh, this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the uh, so and, and maybe your question is still still open. I mm -hmm. try to think about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can look at. Uh, our data from this point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, my question is also to you uh, about the methodology of your work. Uh, still, censorship and especially self censorship is a very volatile uh, matter. Uh, trying to catch it with interviews, especially or exclusively, is a bit compromising matter because some operations. Uh, which are not grasped uh, consciously might slip from your data. So do you intend to use some other, for example, projective methods uh, in order to catch better uh, big operations of the self-censorship? Um, we do not uh, use uh, uh, some projective methods. Uh, <coughs> even we try to do it was something in another field. Uh, and we just uh, create our guide. Uh, we are starting to um, discuss just practices. And even in the end, uh, we ask, do you feel that all uh, that, you are, that we are talking about is a censorship or, se or self-censorship? That's why uh, they are just talking what they are doing in the social media. Mm -hmm. But, this but, is but maybe it would be better to uh, uh, add more uh, methods to talk about censorship. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's more about the perception of censorship other than the operations through which the self-censorship is realized, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Why they restrict themselves? 
and this is one part. Maybe it's not the censorship in traditional understanding, mm -hmm. but we are uh, uh, see that that practice is really popular and they restrict themselves to accept some uh, media content and so it becomes just a part of what can worry for the self-control within the social media image and it, it evolves. Yeah, yeah, maybe yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Maybe we should divide self-control and self-censorship, but maybe it's something in the okay. close to it. That's a negative connotation. Self-control is more, more positive, more manageable. Um, also, the question about censorship and self-censorship, I've been studying quite a lot with regard to the Russian journalists. And uh, together with my colleague, we found out that self-censorship is actually it's a professional skill for Russian journalists. It's not, it's not, something, it's not something negative, it's yeah. something like really aspired, right? Some so, how would you account, uh, do you think that first, self-censorship could be kind of a positive thing for the group of people that you study? And two, do you think that censorship could also be a positive kind of tool for the creation of content? Because there, are, there is a number of studies that actually demonstrated that censors had a positive impact on the kind of final product. Is that in what sense positive? <laughs> Co-production. Co-production, yeah. Co-offers. Co-offers of books. Actually, there was a quite a good research we can check in the chat about that. Uh, based on the East, East German materials. Dominic Bauer. Dominic Bauer. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, some of examples that sense, uh, that uh, self censorship is good. Uh, it comes <coughs> uh, that um, the statements are uh, that um, my freedom, uh, uh, freedom of other people, limits my freedom. Yes, uh, that it was. Uh, and uh, some of um, uh, in uh, informants says that if I know that there are a lot of violence uh, or other not, not good, uh, unacceptable content inside of social media, when I post something or when I write something, I think, I think about others who will uh, read it and I do not post something uh, happening. <coughs> to violence or some uh, content that uh, hurt other. Something they, that they, disappoint my mom, right? Yes, <laughs> they think about other, about reader who will read or some uh, 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 audience who, who will read and watch uh, that content. Uh, content. Content, sorry. <laughs> right, but what about the positive impact of censorship? Do you think? There is one? Uh, but maybe it's like a pro professional question. I'm just thinking uh, in the uh, practices of students who are not uh, journalists, uh, who are just um, trying to say why they control themselves, uh, not only to uh, consult, uh, consult, consult, consumption, but uh, during the production of their own content. I mean, what can I add here? I think that self-censorship actually decreases the anxiety among the users because uh, it's really difficult and there, there is a number of studies which declares the anxiety of the user of any type of social media. You're being exposed to the others and you're waiting for the reaction. So basically when you're censoring yourself, you might not post something so you won't be that nervous in the, in, as, as an outcome. So, well, the, the question is what are the limitations? Yeah, what are the affordances of a specific platform to kind of craft your self-censorship practices? Because for this uh, Instagram, you have the close friends list. Uh, for the Facebook, you can, I don't know, uh, modify your security settings, the privacy settings, so uh, a very certain number of people would see what you're posting. My question is rather about, sorry, I might be interrupting uh, the discussion, but my question would, whether, would be whether censorship and kind of creating several profiles, right, some of them anonymous, some of them for fake things, uh, would it have some impact on creativity? Because when people don't know me, right, so I don't know, some uh, Twitter account such as Kierden, remember this guy? Yeah. Uh, 
so that was kind of you know, creative. Nobody knew him in the court, right? right? But they were quite creative and they were doing that, but kind of the initial premise was that we are censoring ourselves. We are not showing who we are, right? Mm -hmm. But we have the total freedom to for production, for the kind of for creativity. So in that sense, can we find something something like that within the audience of those people that you've studied? So this is my question. Uh -huh. This is this is uh, this is the identity yes. of like, role playing, but well, it depends if you're not creating the evil doppelganger. But maybe this is the point where, where the censorship is starting. Uh, they start to think about uh, the censorship. This is when you overcome the censorship, you become creative uh, at one point, or you become a troll. <laughs> so, okay, uh, the censorship is below the notion and the rethink uh, uh, what is censorship. Uh, add <coughs> more uh, meanings to that notion. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for um, the three inspiring projects on the social media. My question will um, go to the student group, but I'm not sure that it's more general. Um, I'm thinking about the statement which, with, with, with which you started, uh, generating qualitative change which comes with social media. With social media. And then you um, developed your research um, design and the theories and all this stuff and the, the, your results. And I would like to ask whether this would be necessary to be more precise concerning the changes because um, the, and I appreciate this um, algorithm idea or the concept of algorithm as something what changes something concerning the use of media in general or the construction of self-identification um, of young people. I don't know what is the change exactly, but um, maybe this is uh, an interesting concept. Nevertheless, these uh, things about uh, your findings, beauty, sports and so on, this is not um, invention of social media. It is already, it's older, and it is also in other media. So, <coughs> in this objectivization of the self, or something like this, uh, or the, what you presented as results, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I would like to be provocative, and I would say it has nothing to do with social media. So, what um, I want to, and this is something, it's not only your project, this is something which is um, about all the th these theories of this concept and ideas of social media that there is something qualitatively new. Yeah. And I can't see this without any comparisons to other media, to other times, to other behavior of young people or whatever. That's a very good question, and actually this is the point we've been discussing on the way here. You know, we talked about, like, what would it be in the 17th century, mm -hmm. what would it be in the 18th century, mm -hmm. what about the pictures, what about the artwork, mm -hmm. do you think that the U.S. influence, are you really thinking that we're coming mm -hmm. up with something new, and uh, he was actually our Go ahead. Okay, so, uh, yeah. the, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a quite a long argument, that, that was actually my point. I, uh, I've been doing research for quite a while. <laughs> um, um, working um, with, I think that it's about the scale and the intensity of the interaction. And I really do love the theory of performances, and I try to uh, like think through it in uh, when it comes to the social media. And I, I do think that the way how uh, the technology is structured is therefore influencing the way how it's perceived. And it's kind of uh, like I am. I, I'm falling for the technological determinism a little bit. Like I can kind of stop myself here. So uh, I, I would say that we would need this experiment, uh, the latter stage of uh, our research, uh, to actually get some uh, some proof uh, for the way how values are changing. Uh, so like our idea is about the uh, the attribution of the values. Uh, which is uh, incorrect, but based on the emotional side of the experience of technology use. Mm -hmm. So uh, it would be really good to ask people about their values before they use social media and then uh, after, after it. Uh, 
I, I am not sure that we will be able to make a, a, a certain statement on the um, uh, causation, mm -hmm. but the whole process is when we try to explain how it happened. Uh, it, did I answer you? Yeah, yeah. A little bit. Thank you so much. It's, it's a very good thing. Thank you for the support here. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, I have actually a similar uh, question referring to another, uh, well, uh, catch word that you you've used several times, mentioned um, emotional type of reasoning. Yeah. So I wonder what are the other types of reasoning uh, that you can find out there? Uh, and how exactly you differentiate the emotional type of reasoning from, from other types of reasoning? And then how do you know that there is an emotional type of reasoning that is currently rising as opposed to other uh, types of reasoning. I'm asking that just because uh, I think it's purely a ideological statement, uh, implying that there is a, well, there is a certain uh, reasonable type of reasoning, the, the rational rationality uh, that uh, somehow uh, faces, uh, faces a crisis now. Uh, and what, what actually uh, what is actually in trouble uh, now is perhaps not the type of reasoning, but the, the belief of certain intellectuals, certain theories that uh, there is no uh, no space for, for human emotions in politics whatsoever. Uh, so I would, uh, would love to hear something about the empirical uh, foundations for this kind of uh, this kind of statement that there is a, an emotional type of reasoning. And I will have a, uh, another question for Pastor Kim. Okay. Uh, I think I hear Nick Mercedes uh, to refer to Constantine as well as uh, the claim that the world is full of experts nowadays and everyone is, is an expert, right? You, uh, with an access to the technology, have a great opportunity to see various ways of uh, the explanation of the same thing. And uh, the way how it's reasoning, the reasoning happens itself. Uh, we, uh, we used to assume, like before the narrative paradigm was uh, introduced by Schiffer back, I don't know, in the 70s, but uh, anyway, uh, there always was a the logic, uh, especially in the, in, in, in the politics. Uh, so, uh, excuse <laughs> me, what, what was there? Uh, there was logic, well, I, 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 I hope so. <laughs> uh, so the politics was completely logical. No, I, I, I cannot say that. Um, what, what exactly are you saying? What exactly am I saying? That's a good thing, because uh, what you said uh, made me think of, uh, of uh, the way how uh, emotional the field is and how emotional everything is. And, um, but the idea here is that we are talking on a quite, uh, not a simple, but a solid uh, topics of uh, health, beauty, fitness, so these are uh, these these are the fields where we do have uh, experts as the doctors as those who uh, can show their opinion on things and uh, the overall attitude towards uh, it could be uh, the way how you need to live your life to be healthy, beautiful, and successful. Uh, over the years, it was kind of structured <coughs> and explained, uh, and we want to see. How in the social media it's uh, being sold and attached uh, to the uh, to the to the different categories of values. So the thing is, the thing is that uh, we have values, we have practices, we have social media. Social media is coming and changing the values and the practices and it goes with our self-reflection and the way how we use social media. That's not that... Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't know if social media comes and, and changes anything. I, I, I don't think so. But uh, uh, okay. I, I wonder what is the... What, what, how do you know that uh, uh, those things you're talking about, which are indeed very much present, like beauty or, or health, uh, on, which are very much present in social media. How do you know it is somehow related to the rise of uh, a new kind of reason? I mean, you have a whole genealogy of, of that uh, yeah. in, in Foucault, for instance, uh, which tells us how the, the techniques of uh, care uh, of self and also uh, 
biopolitical perception of, of human self or on the right. But they are inherently rational. So this is a new kind of rationality. Uh, they are, well, I would say that they are ultra rational because they impose on us a specific kind of rationality which makes it inevitable for us uh, to pursue uh, maximization of health and maximization of utility. It has nothing to do with emotions. I, I don't really understand the idea that uh, somehow social media who um, promote the, the health agenda there uh, adding something emotional to, to the discourse. I, I actually don't see any kind of uh, new emotion there. Well, it uses the emotions to uh, to kind of reattribute the values. Well, in our sense. Uh, okay. <coughs> Thanks, Andy. Mm -hmm. But I have, yeah, uh, well, I was not there for yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I was. Uh, thank you for the stuff. Uh, I was thinking of what actually this whole garden story has to our understanding of power or other functions. I think the two cases are perfectly big, and they are indeed very, very different. Uh, because in one case you have uh, you have somebody who basically, um, I would say, abuses uh, yeah. the, the, the scientific expertise. <coughs> this is a strategy that she takes every time. Like every time she faces any kind of objection, she says, well, it is because you haven't read uh, the, the, the basic stuff in sociology. Yep. And I've, of course, I've seen people who are professors of sociology themselves. Yeah, that's why I, I took this case yeah. up. Yeah, yeah they did. That. Yeah, thanks for that. And in the other case, it, it's, I would say that it's kind of you know, more like um, uh, scientific in a, in, a, in, a, in a fundamental meaning of, uh, of the science. Because the, the guy basically comes with a, with a, uh, with a, secret, with a secret question to how do you know? Uh, and uh, these are two different ways of, uh, of science operating in, in a broader concept. Now, with this uh, science of expertise, uh, suggested by Collins, what he tries to do this is my understanding. He tries to compartmentalize uh, different kinds of expertise. And what we see here is precisely the opposite, that people from, uh, from the scientific field are kind of encroaching on, uh, on, 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 on everyday life and trying to subsume it under uh, scientific authority. And on the other hand, people coming from, uh, from the, the layman uh, world, they kind of try to adopt, uh, philo not even scientific, but philosophical techniques. So I wonder what, what, what does uh, the whole social science expertise program make of it? Well, that's the question. Uh, when we try to present uh, the scheme uh, using uh, the concept of uh, study of expertise to an STS center at the European University, uh, they uh, they stated that they asked some questions about the nature of knowledge, like uh, all the expert all the experts must be uh, scientists in some way, and uh, mm -hmm. they must be. Uh, they must be relevant, they, they must be connected with the scientific institutions, <coughs> the knowledge institutions. By definition. By definition. Uh, I don't know if uh, the STS Center in the European University is the, uh, can speak for all scientific, uh, scientific knowledge studies uh, at all, but um, after that, uh, we try to avoid the, the question uh, of nature of knowledge. Uh, I mean, what what was the reason to, to look for another optics uh, to try to adopt the Baldansky pragmatism or something? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it was the way to leave the, the question uh, of the nature of knowledge because it will uh, be raised again and again. Uh, Okay, feminism is theory, uh, flat earth is not. And that's why uh, I try to, to go deeper on a, on a more basic level. And you are completely right about, uh, about that, that Roman Milovanov uh, asks philosophical questions. He starts as a real scientist. Uh, four times uh, have to have to, to reflect on the nature of uh, of the knowledge. Uh, physics, uh, 
biologist and so on. So he is a he is a sociologist and, and, and astrophysics at the same time. So basically, you are trying to, to abandon uh, the VSDS paradigm just because it is too attached to the idea of scientific knowledge and rather yes, go to yes, those yes. political theories who have uh, like a more neutral understanding of how knowledge is situated in different. Yes, uh, to leave the hierarchy. Anyway, uh, I think you 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 might agree with that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, questions to the Collins and others. They have a hierarchy of knowledge. It's the big mistake. Uh, yeah. Thanks. For example, I, what, what I don't understand, how they can call uh, their uh, uh, program as this third wave of uh, STS as they don't adopt uh, the basic principles of the second. Principle of symmetry. Yeah, that one they, that that the idea. Yeah. I think I will go from it. Okay. Somebody wants to throw in a question. I actually had a question about uh, also the Constantine thought what <coughs> does uh, symmetry mean uh, in the context of future because you stressed it in the last slide. Well it's it's like a metaphor because uh, in Bloor uh, Bloor's program is mm -hmm. the methodological principle how to treat uh, different uh, forms of knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, I try to use uh, methodological principle as a metaphor of uh, being on the platform of being mm -hmm. and of how different forms of knowledge are competing but there, but, I mean if you if you take how they're really competing it's not complete well that's, that's symmetry I mean somebody can I don't know uh, promote their videos by money and some, someone can use... But epistemological, on the, ba the basic level, there is no hierarchy of, of, of forms of knowledge. Because if you, uh, can, if you come to the university, uh, 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 if you come to the university, there is an institutional form of knowledge, yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you flat there, uh, flat there, you go away, please. Uh, and with you, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. But you yourself you, you, you said that YouTube started banning <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. That's it. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. I have a question or two questions for the group research on Instagram. I was quite interested with your topic about the algorithmic production of emotions. Mm -hmm. I intended to interview the problemists. Uh, maybe not in Instagram, but uh, I don't know, in Yandex, but who might be okay. more accessible uh, to study the techniques of this application. This is the first question. And the second one uh, concerns the design of your presentation, uh, as far as you're so conscious about uh, <laughs> emotions and uh, consumption. Uh, what for do you use the pictures in your slides? What well, for do you use the pictures? Yeah, okay. which are not related to the topic. What do you mean? <laughs> this, this, this figure of pictures of... Uh, of the Barbie? Yeah. Barbie, yeah. yeah. And of these wooden dolls and... and yeah, it, it's interesting from the point of view of the construction of what message you you would like to transfer with that. Okay, so uh, the first question was about the uh, the possibility of uh, the interviewing uh, with uh, those who design algorithms and platforms. Uh, this is a very good question, and uh, I think that we do really need to do this side because we do speak about the effects of the technology and the algorithm itself though we uh, never uh, go on the other side uh, but the user and I'll just take this question and i say that we, we will do it within this one uh, project or maybe within the other so uh, it's, it, it's a good question the design of the presentation, which I myself find very, you know, simple and attractive, uh, it was uh, related to the uh, the concept of the Barbie doll and the idea of the Barbie and the idea of the way how uh, women been portrayed quite for a long time. And the slide number. Can you, can you show me this one? Oh, there, there was one picture which did make sense. Yes, can I get uh, no, no. uh, Well, I think we will be wasting our time answering this one. So, um, 
<laughs> it has the same uh, the same uh, the same uh, the, the same kind of theme for the presentation. And the slide number nine, when we discuss the findings of the interviews, I emphasize that uh, the issue of uh, the eating disorders was crucial for us as those who've been exposed a lot to the Instagram content reported the eating disorders and talked about their experiences. So the picture which, uh, thank you very much, that's very nice, I do appreciate that. This picture is representing two different types and two different shapes of female bodies, uh, which is a reflection to the experience of our respondents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And well, the research design, it's about the Instagram, so we got the barbie with the Instagram. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I, I thank you once again for both of your questions. Okay. Um. Uh, which can lead to the emancipation of critics, but 
I would say still comes to mm -hmm. culture. Okay. If there is certain culture. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have to a question of Facebook. Do, uh, do all of that. I don't know whether already someone asked at the beginning, but I was, it was not here at the beginning of the session. Uh, what <coughs> self censorship in Facebook? I mean, Facebook's you, the privacy settings and the ways you can actually steer your uh, lenta or what, who says what, who sees what on your Facebook is actually so uh, easy to manipulate that actually, I mean, the censorship is for me in a way the question which groups of your you know, people who are subscribe to see what. Is it censorship or when you like, you know, you have like 50 groups of different people who see different things? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, I think from <coughs> different ways of looking at censorship, it's like, you know, creating your viewer communities more than, than censorship, which is of course connected with censorship. You can have, a, you can have one group with which you share, I don't know, extremely political information, but it's still not visible for, for the rest of it. So, was exactly thinking about because it's, I think it's very different than contact here uh, from the from the from the setting and from, from exactly this way of uh, content user based content or whatever it, it is called uh, and then exactly what I was wondering whether it kind of influence uh, also the whether it came up in, in the answers uh, that was given uh, to you by the students uh, and whether how it influenced your contextualization of the Thank you for the question also very interesting for me to think about this further. But uh, concerning the data, uh, we are starting to talk about how you open your account and then uh, is it account open or closed to what kind of people uh, and so on. And we are, when we are talking about it, um, we may be more talking about the freedom inside of, uh, the freedom of um, present yourself different part of people uh, inside of social media. It looks like for them like some options uh, options for different activities what they can do inside of social media. But uh, maybe you are right the other side of that like freedom is a responsibility of uh, personal identity like maybe policy about identity presentation and um, identity profile in different um, communities and maybe it's also um, that activity could be provocative to do something more um, uh, that uh, would be a subject of censorship or even self-censorship uh, because uh, that uh, like openness and closeness uh, of community, a uh, different kind of regimes inside of social media can uh, provoke to do um, maybe like unacceptable content. Yes, yeah, very uh, um, like, um, flexible. Uh, boundaries between what is freedom and what is uh, um, censorship. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. I, I will show some, uh, I will try to find some uh, uh, examples when we discuss uh, about uh, that contradiction. <coughs> uh, opening, uh, open to and closed groups instead of Facebook. And uh, Fantasti also, uh, there are different regimes. And when students um, say about comparing Fantasti and uh, Facebook, they are talking just about different uh, generations. Uh, the older generations are in uh, Facebook uh, and uh, younger people more in Fantasti and they are uh, looking at Fantasti. Sometimes more options uh, to do something, but uh, they understand if you are uh, if you a civic activist, you should be in uh, Facebook. Okay. Mm -hmm.
the issue of Constantine once more. <laughs> uh, I also, yeah, you mentioned in the beginning the, uh, that some researchers um, know the process of commodification that happens in the internet, and I wanted to ask you about this process in relation to YouTube, because uh, if we take, for example, Russian like bloggers and how and the reactions to like comments and how like viewers. Uh, uh, receive these messages uh, from bloggers, and especially from the most popular bloggers. That, uh, so I, uh, like, on, on the intuitive level, I see the, that there is um, this, um, that people realize that, like, this is more, like, uh, more commercial, that, like, most of the YouTube bloggers uh, are um, supported by adver advertising, and that's why they have to speak to a specific they, they can't be too radical, they can to express their political views because sometimes this advertising is also political and so on and so on. And, uh, and uh, so the question is whether this uh, kind of layer of superficiality, artificiality is in any way uh, important for your research, like if, if this critique is like real critique ah. or if it's super superficial. Because, uh, I think it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, because the logic of uh, the cultural logic uh, works uh, behind the, in, uh, on the more basic level than uh, the, the interest. Of course, interest exists, social mm -hmm. interest, economic interest, but okay. it's, it's okay. 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 Well, anyway, uh, all the platforms, but YouTube, YouTube especially, uh, uh, they adopt uh, two logic. Uh, the logic of social media and the logic of social network. Mm -hmm. And there are, uh, I mean, people feel uh, in the comment section like they are uh, sometimes. I mean, it's, it, there are a lot of researchers about this, uh, but they feel like they are, they can communicate to each other. And sometimes mm -hmm. when they come to a channel uh, like the media, they feel like they talk to a TV uh, <laughs> screen. <laughs> uh, I mean, sometimes they ask, uh, uh, constructive questions like uh, argumenting mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so on. But sometimes they just mm -hmm. bullshit. So mm -hmm. it's too logic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank the presenters. Uh, what? Huh? Fresh air. We should go for the fresh air. Okay, so thank you again for your presentation. <laughs>